Hello and welcome to part three on our lecture series on nature and nurture and how it relates to psychology here at Learning the Social Sciences. Sigmund Freud talked about bad parenting, more specifically bad mothering. And of course, he is one of the greats in psychology. Now, a lot of his theories have been disproven, while some of his theories are still used today. However, he did blame asthma and schizophrenia on bad mothering, and that is obviously not true. And over the generations, though, this theory of bad mothers or bad parents have been reinforced. Even in the 1990s, a book came out by Thomas Bradshaw that stated that Adults have survived the toxic parents and have swarmed to recovery groups. Now, this obviously is a narrative where a lot of blame is put on the parents. However, what has psychology found out about the influence on parenting as we grow up? So about 10% of a person's personality comes from being in a shared environmental influential group. So that would be, you know, parents coming to around 10%. What are they mainly kind of giving their child? It usually comes more in the forms of shared values and shared beliefs. We have a lot of other impacts in our life. We, of course, have our prenatal development and environment that has something to do with who we are as we grow up, but also we have our peers, peer influence, and we also have our culture. Nature of course, relates to our genetic, but nurture begins in the womb. And there is a lot throughout our lifetime that is nurturing who we are as a person. So a major influence in our lives is culture. Culture is the behavior, ideas, attitudes, and tradition shared by a large group of people and transmitted from one generation to the next. So how does culture influence us? And for example, what happens if we are kind of raised within one culture, but then we move to another culture group? So we're going to be examining that because each culture has its cultural variations. For example, a North American traveling to Europe might be surprised by all these small cars and that left-handed use of forks. I myself am married to a German and we have talked about that left-handed use of forks. Some people are also taken aback by maybe some of that attire on the beaches in Europe compared to what they're used to maybe if they're from like the Midwest of the United States. For example, when looking at cultural variations are when Middle Easterners travel to North America and see a picnic going on. They're surprised that people are eating outside just on the ground. Now that is something that you would typically not do in a Middle Eastern country simply because of, yeah, how the country is for its geography. Now, yes, you can go and picnic in some parks in the Middle East because they do have grass, obviously, but it's not the same in terms of the mass, the masses in the United States going out and doing their picnics for fun. So try to think of some cultural variations that you know if you've traveled around the world um, or that you just know even within your own communities. Uh, there's a lot of examples you could definitely uh, have. So now we're going to be jumping into norms. Norms are the rules for accepted and expected behavior within our society. Now, these are not the laws that we're following. So yes, you have to drive on the correct side of the road. That's not following a social norm. That's following a law. But these are just what you're kind of supposed to do and expected to do. So let's take personal space as an example, kind of our buffer zone that we all have. Some people have a big buffer zone. They don't want anybody coming into their bubble, while some people really don't have a bubble at all. Um, now, it all kind of depends where you are in the situations in terms of that personal space. For a work environment, say you're going to work, usually people are really giving each other plenty of buffer zone room, their personal space. 
Um, however, if you're going to say a family reunion, well, there's probably a lot of hugging going on. And if everybody knows that one member of the family is not really a hugger, well, then there's a lot of you know smiles going on in that situation. Uh, but we all have these kind of personal space uh, expectations. Another social norm, for example, is you walk into an elevator and you just look nicely at, you know, the front of the elevator door waiting for it to open. You traditionally don't get into an elevator and sit down on the ground looking at the back of it. Other people walking in or other people that are already in the elevator might be looking at you with kind of some skepticism and wondering what's going on because you are breaking a social norm. You're doing something that is not really expected or accepted by society. We usually don't go and sit on the floor in an elevator. So something else related are memes. Now, of course, we know memes from you know social media, but memes here for psychology are self-replicating ideas, fashions, and innovations passed from one person to the next. Oh so, yeah, it does relate to what's going on on social media. But evolutionary psychologists look at memes and how they have evolved over time and how then they are influencing, of course, our social norms. So another thing that we have is culture that definitely impacts us. So how difficult would it be though for you to join another culture? My husband, as I have mentioned, has moved from Germany to the United States, but he actually grew up in a country that doesn't exist anymore, East Germany. Uh, and so there is, you know, kind of a bigger culture change when you're thinking about just his upbringing there and coming here. But how about you? If you've always lived in the United States, uh, how easily could you move to China and blend in? Well, if you're somebody that maybe has some Chinese heritage or you live in a very diverse community, it might not be that much of a shock for you, um, but for some people, if they really haven't had a lot of exposure to Chinese culture, the language, the food, you could experience something called culture shock. And this is an area where sociocultural psychologists look into to kind of see how people adapt and change going from one culture to the other. Now, there's another that area that psychologists look at that definitely is uh, coming with nature and nurture in the debate. What happens if a human is raised in the absence of other humans? Those ones are called feral children. And we have a few examples from history. We have one of an individual named Victor from France who was discovered uh, kind of roaming the woods and he was brought in and he, he was nonverbal. He was making noises, but he was not saying any French. Uh, and so he was sent to a school and put under the leadership of one uh, teacher to try to teach him how to speak and how to, uh, well, kind of act French for the time period in the 1800s. Uh, and Victor was able to achieve a certain level. He was uh, speaking, but he never really picked up the whole syntax of the French language. Another example is Jeannie, who was raised under extreme abuse in California. Her parents had her tied to a potty chair or sleeping in her bed. She had nothing in terms of her room for stimulation. They didn't interact with her and she was still given baby food uh, as a, yeah, an older child. And with her, she also did not develop the language skills. Now, when she was finally rescued and she had a team of doctors, linguists, psychologists around her, she still only got to a certain level with her English language skills. She couldn't really get over the hurdle to be totally within that uh, realm of freely and fluently speaking. And so there are some things we have learned from feral children, but of course we could never, ever, ever take a child and put them into a situation uh, where we could, you know, well, I guess scientifically go through and see, you know, is there a cutoff in terms of language acquisition? Is there a certain cutoff in terms of how a sp uh, child is going to learn how to socialize within a society? That would be an extremely unethical study. But unfortunately, we do have feral children that we have used uh, to find out information about language acquisition and about socialization. And there are unfortunately other stories of other children learn besides just Victor and Jeannie that uh, psychologists and other 
uh, doctors and professionals have used to learn more about these fields, especially within psychology. So that is our lecture series here on Nature and Nurture. If you have any other questions or comments, leave them down below. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. Remember to like and subscribe. Bye-bye.